Our next guest entered the history books as the youngest person to sail single-handedly around the globe, later breaking the record for the fastest solo circumnavigation. But just over 10 years ago, she jumped ship, quite literally, into a new challenge, one that was even bigger than the Everest of the seas, that of trying to restructure the world economy. She is a pioneer of the circular economy, and her name is synonymous with the global war on waste. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome to this morning, Dame Ellen MacArthur, founder of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Dame Ellen, you're very, very welcome uh, this morning. I just wanted to ask you, for those perhaps who are not familiar, what is a circular economy and how did you come around to this way of thinking? Well, first of all, you introduced me as a sailor and my life has moved on a very, very long way from there. Um, perhaps best to introduce the circular economy, I could tell a little bit of my story. Um, I never, ever thought I would be doing this. I thought I would be sailing around the world forever. From the age of four years old, that was my dream, to one day somehow sail around the world. So when that became reality, and I was racing in transatlantic and round the world races, I was literally living the dream. I was doing everything that I would ever hoped I'd be doing, and I loved it. But when you set sail on a boat around the world, especially around the world, you leave for a long period of time. You collect everything that you need for your survival, for that, that race, that record attempt. And when you leave, you manage what you have down to the last packet of food and the last drop of oil. Everything is absolutely precious. And it gives you this incredible understanding of what finite is. Now, I'd never really considered it in my life before, but suddenly what I had on that boat was all I had and there was no more. And I carried on with the records, I carried on with the round the world. And then after the second round the world, the round the world record attempt, I set foot off the boat at the finish. And I began to question, you know, is our global economy not the same? Aren't we reliant on finite resources that we have once in the history of humanity? And I started to look into it in parallel with sailing. I tried to understand what are the solutions? You know, what does success look like for our global economy? And the more I looked, the more I realized that we didn't really have an answer. What we were suggesting was that we had finite resources and we need to use them carefully. We need to use less. We need to travel less. We need to do less. And everything was about restriction, which, of course, is absolutely fundamental when you have finite resources. But what I was fascinated with was what does success look like? You know, if we have these finite resources, if we know that using them up, as we do in our global economy, really can't run in the long term, then what can? And I began this new journey of learning, speaking to academics, economists, scientists, experts, uh, chief executives, trying to work out how can we use our resources moving forward? How can we use materials? And it could be anything from uh, fossil fuels right through to soil, right through to plastics, right through to um, uh, rare earth metals. Um, how can we use these materials in a different way? And this is where the circular economy came about, with a circular economy from the outset when you design a product, when you design a material, when you design a system, you design so that you design out waste and pollution, you keep those products and materials in use for as long as possible, and then at the end of the life, of the useful life of that product, you get the, the value back out in the best way you possibly can. And if that product happens to be something which is biological, like cotton or timber or food waste, uh, human waste, then that material, that valuable biological material, feeds back into the economy to regenerate natural systems. And suddenly, I had this feeling that if we could shift from linear to circular, then the faster the economy, the actual economy grew, the better, because we're regenerating the economy. And when you look even just at the foundation itself, as I say, starting off with quite a small group, you have now over 150 staff and growing. What is the next phase for advancing the circular economy for you? Because you've gone from a small operation to this, to this major global player that is speaking to business, that is speaking to governments. What's the next stage for you? Well, our next stage really is a continuation of exactly what we do now. We try, you know, we are a tiny team, really. It's, it's 150, seems like a lot from the beginning, but, but it's a tiny team. And we try to have a disproportionately positive effect on the global economy. So where can we take the idea of the circular economy? What can we do with that idea to have a disproportionately positive effect? And so we've done a lot of economic studies, but we've also begun the systemic initiatives that we have, such as plastic packaging. We have a second on fashion and textiles. We have a third on cities and circular economy for food. And as you're well aware, we're also looking at finance and how can finance 
as a flow of money, help to really reinforce and stimulate the circular economy. We work on measurement. Uh, we work with businesses to try to help them move forward on their circular journey and to create these collaborations between as many players as possible. So really for the foundation, it's continuing what we've been doing over the last 10 years, but really ramping it up and really trying to, to, to double down on those things that we can have, that we think can have this disproportionately positive effect. What do governments um, need to do or, or what do other um, actors need to do to incentivize companies to go on this journey? I think you know, one of the first things we did with the circular economy was we went to McKinsey and we looked at the economics of a circular economy. This is back in January 2012. We launched a report at the World Economic Forum. We looked at medium complex goods, so goods that cycle in more than one year, less than 10. And we looked at the, that sector and we said, you know, does the circular economy bring economic value to this sector? And the answer could have quite frankly been no, but it wasn't. It was, yes, it did. In every single item we looked at, which was a mobile phone, a smartphone, a light commercial vehicle, a washing machine and cotton, in each of those examples, circular economy delivered more value. And the total figure was worth 630 billion US dollars to the global economy if we shifted towards that model. Sorry, that was, sorry, the European economy. So we're seeing these really, really large figures, which are economic rationale. So, so how do we do this? I think from, from a business perspective, there is money to be made in circularity. If you can decouple economic growth from resource constraints, that's also good for the economy. It's, it's good for uh, development. It's good for employment. It's also good for the environment. You start to get this win-win situation. So money is definitely a driver. The environment is another driver. When will you feel you have done what you need to do? When do you get to retire again? <laughs> I would love, I would love the moment when the foundation doesn't need to exist and the world mm. is just circular. And when students go to school, they learn about circular examples. They learn about mm. circular design because that's how we design. You know, why would you ever design in a way that creates waste? Would you ever, why would you ever design pollution? Why would you ever not keep things at their highest value? Why would you not regenerate natural systems? I think it would be wonderful if that's just how we think. Of course we're going to think in a circular way because it's natural. It's existed for billions of year, years. You know, life itself never created waste. You know, there's no waste in a forest. Everything regenerates and it's diverse and it's growing and it's a, it's a very healthy environment with, you know, plants of all sizes but there's no waste. So once that becomes normal in our way of thinking, that, that I would be a very happy person. Well, how do you stay so motivated and perhaps we can learn from you? Well, I think, you know, the first thing is something that I take from sailing, which is, you know, when things are difficult, and they are now, aren't they? I mean, they're difficult for everybody. It's, it's a challenging time for so, so many reasons. I always try to look through to the other side. I always have, you know, if you're in a storm, tomorrow's going to be better or the next day is going to be better if the tomorrow isn't better. But you always look forward, look through to the other side. Where do we want to get to? What will be better? And I think that's one element is looking through to the other side and try and focus on what things will be like when it's OK again. And the second thing is just trying to help those around you has a massive impact on you. You know, there are things we struggle with, but there are things that other people struggle with. And I think being more connected to those people who live locally and are challenged in different ways, I think that helps us. The more we can help other people, I think that, that buoys our spirits. Tim Allen, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. I cannot wait for your next light bulb moment and to see where you go. But wishing you and all of your team at the Foundation the very best. And thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.